Have you ever looked at a Greek word and been so confused by how it looks? You want to learn why it's like this, but you don't know how or where to look. What I want to do in this video is highlight a helpful resource that can help us with these morphological mysteries. That's this book here, The Morphology of Biblical Greek by William D. Mounts. This is not a full in-depth review of this book. This book is just a reference book for us to use when we have those difficult morphological questions. So I want to just show you quickly about how we can use this resource. Now let's take the word echo, I have, as an example. I think this is a helpful example because this is a first year word that we all learn as we're beginning Greek. Usually when I teach Greek, I find that a lot of people have questions about this word because on the surface, it doesn't really make sense. Now let's look at the different forms. So we have the present tense, echo, the future is hexo, then our aorist is a second aorist, which is eskon, and then our perfect is eskeka, and then to round it out for all of our weird forms, the imperfect is akon. Now as we can see here, there are some oddities on the different forms of the word. It doesn't look like its present tense and its future and its aorist really have anything to do with one another. So why do each of these forms look the way that they do? Enter our handy dandy resource, Mounce's Morphology. And what we're going to do if we're using the print version, we're going to turn to the index of all of the Greek verbs that are contained in this book, which is a large percentage of the entire corpus of the New Testament. So we're going to look in the index and we're going to look under the Greek words and we're going to look under the lexical form, which is the present active indicative, first person singular, echo. So if we look under echo, notice that we're going to be led to two different places, v-1b parentheses 2, and then another place is v-7. The one that we really want is that first one. Now as we turn to that section, we're going to look through that section for our word. We're going to look for echo. And as we see here, we see that there is the lexical form on the far left, and then each column is the different principal parts for the Greek word. So we just are looking for that left column down until we find echo. Now, as we look at this, notice we have our present active indicative, our future, our aorist, and then our perfect, our four principal parts. Now, next to each of those forms, you have a footnote that gives you a lot more information. That's where you really want to look and how you can best, I think, utilize this resource. You could read this book straight through and get all of the technical, morphological sort of jargon and the linguistic particulars, but I'm lazy. So I just like looking at the word I'm trying to understand. So if we look at echo and we see that it has the 10th footnote, we look underneath 10, it has quite a full explanation for what is going on with this verb. Here, Mounds tells us that the word echo, its true root is sec, and that sigma has dropped off. And to replace the dropped off sigma, a rough breathing has been added. But because there's that key at the end of the root, of ek, right, sec, and then ek, that rough breathing and that key don't like to be next to each other, so the rough breathing changes to a smooth breathing. That's where we get the word echo. Now in the future form, something odd happens. That key combines with the sigma in the square of stops to give us a xi. This forces the smooth breathing mark to reconvert back to a rough breathing mark. So we, instead of getting exo, we get hexo. Mounts further describes for the aorist that instead of the root sec, that that epsilon in between the sigma and the key drops out. So then the root is just the sigma key. So then we add the augment, the second endings, and we get escon. The same thing happens in the perfect with the only addition of the eta after the sigma and the key. Now for the imperfect form, you have your root sec, and we add the augment for the imperfect, and that sigma is in between two short vowels, and that's called an intervocalic sigma, and it drops out. So then you have epsilon, epsilon, key, and then the two epsilons combine and contract into the diphthong A, epsilon, yoda. Now, all this to say, you don't need to know how each of these forms are built on each other. You could memorize each individual form individually and do fine with that. That's how I learned echo. That's how most of us learn 
words like this. Even ancient Greeks probably didn't know the history of why these words were built the way that they are. Just like we don't know the difference of why some English words work the way that they work. Think of the word go. Its present is go and its past is went. Oh, that's super weird. You have two different forms that are completely different in combined in one word. We don't need to know the whole history of the word in order to use the word properly. The same way for the Greeks. But for us, as we're learning Greek, it may be helpful to us to know some of these rules or some of these tips and tricks to help us to figure out a form better. If you can think about how a word is constructed, that can go a long way to help you remember a form and alleviate your frustration as you are reading. So I wanna give you a challenge. The next time that you're looking at a word and you're confused about why it looks the way that it does, pull up something like Mounce's morphology and look it up. It may be a helpful way to help you remember that form or just you learn a new piece of linguistic trivia that can help you with other words down the road. If you do this often enough, you'll start seeing connections with different forms, different words that will help your vocabulary as well as your reading and parsing skills. I hope that helps. Thanks for watching.